Okay, good morning. Um, I'm sorry for the technical issues about the live stream to the YouTube. Um, if anybody on the YouTube uh, channel, please uh, leave a message over there. I uh, said, uh, you know, we cannot live stream YouTube today. But uh, uh, thank you, welcome again to this World Large River and the Delta System Source to Think uh, webinar series. So today we invite Irina Owering from University of Colorado border to give a talk about the Greenland sediment flux. Um, before I introduce Irina, I would like to mention next week, our next webinar, so Wednesday, and also next week, Friday, next week, starting from next week to December, we will have two talks per, per week. So please mark your calendar. So next Wednesday, we will have Yap uh, Ninghos from uh, Uchid University. He will talk about the global view of the, the river delta morphology and also from the source to sink point of view. And also next Friday, we have another very interesting talk uh, from uh, Ruri uh, Shatner from the University of Haifa, Israel. He will talk about the Nile River derived sediment from the source to sink the routing system and all the way along shore transport along the Eastern Mediterranean Sea will be a very, very interesting talk. So um, please come back next Wednesday and next Friday at the same time. Okay, um, Irina, as you can see here, she graduated from uh, uh, Wigenian University in Netherlands and also get a master from Wigenian and also PhD 2002 from Delft University. Now is a associate professor at the University of Border, uh, University of Colorado at the Border. So I believe it's just the seven a.m. for her. So thank you very much, uh, willing to give us a very interesting talk. So Irina, oh, you can go ahead. You can start to share. Thank you, Paul, for like getting us all together in this like source to sink seminar series. Um, it, it's been like such a pleasure to see like how many people stepped up and are like giving talks, etc. I I'm not gonna make all of them, <laughs> but um, I'll hope to like cherry pick a little bit and like see a bunch of you guys' newest and latest and greatest talks in the future too. So what I'll be talking about today. Um, are these studies that we're doing in Greenland. And I mean, in general, like for those of you who don't know me, I see some familiar names. So like I know some people know this. Um, I work on river and coastal processes, deltas in uh, specifically. Um, in general, I ask the questions like, how do these sediments, um, or how do like sedimentary systems get perturbed? How do they change with environmental changes, how does that impact sediment fluxes and morphology of the systems. Um, generally, time scales of like post-glacial is what is the longest that you will like hear about in this talk. Um, and then in Greenland, we also work on the modern system quite a bit. And so in general, when you're looking at like a source to sink system and you're trying to look at like do I have a signal in my upstream basin and do I find it back in my like downstream, far downstream sink? Um, then it's good if that signal in the upstream basin is large, right? And so one of the places where signals of change are large at the moment is in the Arctic regions where climate change is just so much more amplified compared to like global climate change. And so I've been fascinated with thinking about Arctic systems and modern Arctic systems uh, um, to see some of the questions that sometimes we tackle in on a little bit longer time scales as well. Um, this photo is um, sort of um, symbolic of like the high sediment loads that um, get transported in these systems, but 
always seasons are very short, right? So like, yes, there's like this activity that uh, is associated with like the summer season and the few months that there's really like large melt going on, et cetera. But to also remind, remind like everyone that like the system is quiet um, for like a long term of the season too. So I'll um, start with like a little bit longer time scale, which is sort of post Holocene or like Holocene and post glacial sedimentation rates that we studied um, earlier. Like that is a little bit older work um, that I did with colleagues in Delft and um, a little bit with uh, University of Colorado also. But then we uh, moved to like more modern sediment loads, and that part is what uh, provoked the title of this talk: "Modern Sediment Fluxes from Greenland." Um, I'll also talk uh, about work that Meta Bendix is the lead on. She's a, a postdoc in our group, um, funded uh, from Denmark, uh, and has been visiting with us now back with the COVID uh, in Denmark. Um, and she works on the deltaic and the deltaic systems and the progradation rates on in deltas there. And just a quick peek for to like be informative to people and sort of let you know what goes on in the lab in general, like what are our next steps, what are the projects that we're working on now that we don't have like so much out in the literature yet. So modern Greenland used to be a white spot on the map for a long time. And um, there's, there's sort of two papers that came out in the time that I'd been starting to think about Greenland and like the magnitudes of modern uh, sediment fluxes from Greenland that, um, made me thought even harder about this problem and like understand the relevance of this in like a more global um, climate story as well. And so one is uh, came out of like Woods Hole uh, where this group uh, of Maya Batya uh, sampled for iron and showed that um, there's a bioavailable iron that travels with suspended sediment loads um, and casted this hypothesis that it potentially would be a, a um, limited nu a nutrient that normally is limiting in the ocean system and that would be now newly supplied to the ocean system and thus make like sort of an impact on like phytoplankton blooms etc and we'll see this later back in the talk too about a similar uh, timing, there was this paper um, where people put together like uh, more source to sink studies of fjords and sequestration in fjords and how much carbon gets captured uh, when you like have all these deposits coming out of glacial systems. Um, and with the idea that in general, these sediment fluxes are large, these fjords fill up quickly, but with that, there's also carbon storage. And to me, that was like a little non-intuitive from like Greenlandic fluxes because we mostly see like very low um, organic matter contents, um, but it definitely was thought provoking for like, how do these systems play out? And so we set out um, thinking about magnitudes of modern fluxes, but then also some of the um, sink and trapping into the fjords. So just to give you a quick tour of the sedimentary environment, I think many people are um, used to looking at like maybe big Asian deltas or like huge tidal flats somewhere or whatever. Um, so Greenland has these very short source to sink systems. Like the source is at the ice cap um, where meltwater drains off the glacial system um, and then in general, like the pathway over through the terrestrial is orders of like tens of kilometers or so. Um, with some exceptions, sometimes there's big proglacial lakes. I won't talk much about those um, today, but then the sediment gets through the terrestrial system and comes into the marine system. And that's generally in big fjord systems. And so there it's a little bit different from um, a, a huge shelves because there's this trap of the fjord systems in between. So you can see this river Mount Plume um, sort of going into like a, um, this is near Ilulisat in uh, Western Greenland, uh, going into like the fjord system. And sometimes it has to travel a really far away before it's in the open ocean or the bays around Greenland. We started with a study that was like really sedimentary geology, uh, mapping the um, sedimentary infill of one 
um, terrestrial part, you can see the ice cap is like indeed quite near the ocean downstream or the fjord heads downstream from us is only like 10 kilometers downstream or so from this point where we're standing. So you see the ice and the ocean is like not quite in sight, but close. Um, what I wanted to show you here is the sediment style. Like, so these are braid plains. They're, the sedimentation is coarse. There's some Aeolian activity that like leaves Aeolian deposits as well. Often there's glacial lakes that have formed over time um, and have been breached over time. So those are in the sort of deposits that um, have been all deposited after the um, deglaciation. So these are only like 8,000 years or so of deposits. The finer grained sediments um, are interesting in that um, they form these huge packages and the marine sediments are actually exposed. And so we can do some terrestrial field work on the marine sediments because of isostatic rebound that with the unloading of the ice sheet melting away after the uh, late glacial maximum, the land started popping back up. And so some of the marine deposits are, are exposed. Um, and you can just walk these marine terraces and make like um, cross section or like uh, sections, sedimentary sections. And um, we found marine shells in these, so we could like date some of the sediments. One of the messages of this like slide in general is like, look at this section being about 15 meters, 16 meters long. Um, so this would be a section that looks like something like this, but then stacked on top and top and top of each other. Um, you can see that there's like, maybe annual layering, perhaps tidal, but like where we were thinking annual layering in these uh, fine grain sediments. Sometimes we see like small turbidite, uh, turbidites in them too. Um, but in this 13 meter section, we have these two C14 samples. And what it shows you is that there's like very little time difference between this, these two fine grained uh, the, uh, samples and one they're only like a few uh, hundred years apart at best. And so like 13 meters of sedimentation in maybe 300 years. Um, so really rapid sedimentation rates. Um, the student, uh, this is work of a student, Ilya de Winter, who was a PhD student with me and Joop Storms in uh, Delft. Um, and he used uh, a glacial model that I had been exposed to during my postdoc before I was in Delft, um, or back in Delft, um, that is called GC2D, uh, Glacial Code, and then built in a um, sediment entrainment model. And so what you see here is sort of a concept model of the model where like there's a cross section, there's a um, glacier tongue that comes out here, and then there's like sediment at the base that can be like ingrained into the um, into the basal ice. Um, and so what he was after was trying to figure out like when the sediment gets eroded, when does it get picked up? What is the timing of this release of sediment into the fjord where we had some uh, age control over the Holocene? And so uh, in a plan view that looks something like this. This was like a glacier tongue that is sort of representative of the situation in this kangaroo swag fjord that we had data for. Um, and I'm just gonna show you one graph uh, or like a um, time in and, and time, this is simulation time. So like this is like starting like at deglaciation and um, running to the present. Um, and it's a, distance from the glacial front map and the ELA map. So like this is a large cross section of the uh, ice sheets and with ELA being the equilibrium elevation. So the area where there's ablation versus um, accumulation on the glacier. And so these, the color scheme, I should have added the color scheme here. The blues are um, faster sedimentation. So the deposition, um, and then the reds are the places where net erosion is taking place. And so over time, you can see that there's times when deglaciation early on was at a fast rate and the um, actual like delta front, like 
or the glacial margin retreats fast. But at that time, there has not been as much erosion yet, and thus there's like less sediment in stock in the glacier basal layers to like get transported out to the system. And so some of these like depositional um, peaks, when um, the sediment really like starts like being deposited at the glacier margin um, and is able to be flushed out into the like source to sink system as we look at it, are relatively late in the deglaciation cycle. So, so this lagging of the system is something that I'm, I've been interested in and we're still working on like getting the processes represented better with a PhD student now at uh, the University of Colorado at U. So there were some lessons that we learned from these like Holocene glacial valley fills, um, that the sedimentation rates can be extremely rapid, that the sedimentary architecture is like really dependent on the timing of the glaciation, uh, and when a certain fjord at a certain latitude um, starts deglaciating, um, and that the glacial sediment poles, the time that there's as like maybe peak production of sediment or peak availability of sediment um, in to uh, like ingested into the source to sink system might lag the sort of meltwater uh, deglaciation peak. And these are like hypothetical because that's model behavior that we're looking at. And there's um, some indication in the Kangaloo's work short that that holds up, but um, Dating is also sparse enough that you could argue a little bit different ways too. So that made me even more fascinated with like also thinking about the modern um, sediment loads and uh, taking um, observations on like a more, a more like day to day, year to year time scale. Um, what's interesting is that that has not been systematically done um for a long time like sort of the pioneer of that is um professor Hasshold at the university of copenhagen and he um monitored this one river um that we did the holocene uh, sedimentary architecture work on um so that's how i could connect it to that community and what i wanted to point out to you here is that so Greenland is a really important component. The meltwater of Greenland is a really important component to like global sea level rise at the moment. And we model this and people or we um, as a community, um, scientists model this. And you can see that there's this like big like ramp up of um, runoff and melt of Greenland. And even this week that was in the news, right? That like, if you would add the data point for like 2019 and 2020 there would still like again be like high up here um but interestingly the river observations are like actually like really sh pretty short duration and not very systematic and on this one river system they're like now a record that's a little longer than 10 years but that's it um so our group built another uh, gauging station on a river system a little bit further south and then there's another um more long-term um, gauging station on the on the east coast that uh, Copenhagen maintains too. So river river observations at first cut like we want to know just volumes of water right? that's the uh, the relevant question for sea level rise but I got interested also in this like high turbidity that these river systems have and how much export is there of sediments too. Um, did we know that before? Well, people had been doing back of the envelope um, reconstructions, but still John Milliman and Katie Farnsworth in 2011 like state that like, as far as we know, which is a, a big sign, no global sediment budget has taken into account the impact of glacial erosion in high latitude land masses and particularly Greenland. So that's sort of an endorsement that they want to see some more research there. And so that then leads to questions like, what is the total magnitude? How is it distributed around Greenland is relevant more for ocean and oceanic processes. Um, and what are the processes that control that magnitude and distribution? So we had, we've had like field campaigns on and off since 2007. Uh, I'll show you a bunch of work that I did with Ben Hudson 
Um, this was in the Kangaroostwak Fjord, in the Pakitsup River, and then in that Nayuatquat River that I just showed the gauging station of. Um, in general, these were short campaigns where we um, collected bottle wa uh, water samples. Um, for kangaroos work, there's an automatic suction pump. So that's the most continuous record over a season. And then for the others, we built like stage to discharge relationships to like have an idea of what kind of discharges and loads come out of these. Um, there's some like small boat oceanography that we did um, that helped us constrain plume dynamics as well and grain size measurements. Cool. So when you hear me talk about this one river system, the, the Watson River in Kangalooswak. Um, from the get-go, we knew that we needed to upscale to like something like a satellite coverage um, if we wanted to say something about the sediment flux of Greenland as a bigger system. And so Ben Hudson was like a key player in that. He was a PhD student with me um, at the time. And he um, started mapping both water coverage from Landsat automatically, and it's these like, automatic algorithms in Google Earth Engine that we take advantage of the fact that they've organized the whole stacks of Landsat, Landsat data um, and provided this idea that if we know for each pixel in each Landsat image that is cloud free, whether it was water or not water, we can then look in the reflectance of the, um, the visible bands um, whether there's sediment in the water or there's no sediment. And so what I'm showing you here is like we calibrated, of course, first um, whether that could be done or not. And so in the Watson River, where there is the most data, we like um, constructed a retrieval algorithm for suspended sediment concentration. So that is what I show here. Um, it relates uh, band four reflectance. So this comes out of the Landsat product. Um, and is a measure of like how turbid the water is. And so you can see if you like tie every single pixel to like an actual bottle sample, um, what that relationship pans out to. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds more about bottle samples, um, but you needed this like golden thing where like the pass of the Landsat is the day of the bottle sample or the four hours around the bottle sample is how Ben defined the window that he thought was acceptable. So then you're like suddenly down to like a really small data set. Um, and so then what we started doing is like, we realized the data that we had was still like relatively sparse. Um, that is because the season is short. That is because the cloud cover is pretty um, abundant or frequent. And so um, Ben and I decided that we would make maps of um, average suspended concentration in these river systems. And so the way that works is like you start stacking and mapping suspended sediment concentration from like every single image. And that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, this would be like suspended sediment concentration in the cells where there's water. What is the turbidity for each of them? And then what if you like contrast two different images and you look at what the sediment concentrations are. And so like this systematically got done by stacking all the imagery that's cloud free and available to be used over the Landsat 7 record. So it's about 10 years of data or so. Um, and then what I wanted to point out with this example is these, this is like one uh, big river system. It's West Greenland. Um, one would expect that the glacier lobe in the north versus the glacier lobe in the south have probably exactly the same climatology with like small differences, maybe in snow and wind patterns. But these are not like high relief um, areas so much when you're like at the a level of the ice cap. They're like pretty gentle um, um, sloping um, ice caps or outlets of the ice sheet. So if you would think that the the climatology is very similar, you would think like meltwater pulses may be similar too, or maybe this is even the bigger system and you would like expect that there's like also bigger loads coming out of this northern arm and that's not the case. So something else there is still up. So like you could not predict 
to spend concentration by just saying like, oh, the like warm areas of Greenland are doing this, the cold areas of Greenland are doing that. So um, if you systematically go through the whole um, Landsat archive, you can um, map about 160 land terminating um, glaciers that have a reverse stretch over which you can apply this technique and you generate something like this map over here where um, the color of the dot is an indication of like how turbid that river system as an average over 10 years in the melt season is. Um, and so you see that variability that I was just showing you for one system like somewhere over here um, is compare, compared to like some of the regional patterns still hold up. The warmer areas definitely have like higher uh, sediment concentrations than the real cold areas. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out too that was really interesting to us is that there's these hot spots in um, turbidity. And so if you plot this as a frequency diagram, then you can see that about like maybe 10% of the rivers only have rivers have like concentrations that are systematically over a season like really really high and then there's a lot of rivers that are like more, much more quiescent in parts of the season um so we started uh tinkering with um explanatory regression models and sort of the simple process model that uh, I casted for this is an erosion potential model. This is used quite a bit in like glacial geomorphology, um, where you just pose that the erosion of a glacier um, is um, dependent on the driving shear stress, the gravitational driving shear stress, and the sliding rates of the ice, so the sliding rate of the glacier. It turns that you can say something about the sliding rate at the base, um, by a, a relationship to like what's the sliding rate at the surface or the velocity that people track from glaciers. Um, if you also know the, um, the mass of the ice moving through, so like the density of ice, the um, gravitational constant, the thickness and the slope. And so this is a very first order uh, kind of model, but um, it's been shown that at first order that it can work. So the good thing about this is that we're doing this in a time that satellite data sets and the work that's been done on the, glacier, on the Greenland ice sheet like provides every single one of these elements. So I collaborated or we collaborated with Mathieu Morligam and then with Twyla Moon and Ian Yorkin to like use both the velocity, so that um, surface velocity that I pointed out in that previous little equation, um, as well as ice thickness from the band map that had been like mapped from airborne radar. And so what you then can do, and Ben did this, um, is for each sort of glacial hydrological catchment, calculate the mean erosion project, uh, mean erosion proxy. Um, we did this only over the melt affected area, so we don't like extend the catchments like way up to the ice divide, um, because we assumed that like such a large part of these catchments are um, inactive and um, are not sliding. So like we wanted to make our sliding proxy or our erosion proxy relevant for the part that's really active. So that is what I plot here. Um, so this is the erosion uh, potential for each of these catchments compared to their long-term turbidity or like plotted versus their long-term turbidity. So any single data point on this has like the, a, a glacial, ice glaciological catchment behind it and then mapped this erosion potential for that specific catchment. And that's what this relationship is showing you. And so it's a scattered plot, um, but it is a positive and significant correlation between those two factors. So what we concluded is that the uh, turbidity of these river systems is maybe more controlled by like the ice processes and the sort of the sliding rates, et cetera, um, as opposed to just the water, um, the water, meltwater discharge. 
Um, if you do the same plot for a meltwater discharge from modeled meltwater per catchment, you'll still find a, correl a positive correlation too, but it's quite a bit less than this correlation with ice processes. Um, most people ask me, uh, is there also a lithology effect? So I like threw this slide in um, to say like we tried, uh, we thought we would back it out. And I think the obvious understanding of like how this works in uh, geomorphology is like there should be an impact of lithology. I think the part where we get the effect not uh, being apparent is that there's not that much like really friable rock in Greenland. There's only small patches. And so um, our data does not resolve differences in lithology well enough if we map it back to like Schmidt hammer, erodibility, etc. Another maybe complicating factor is we don't know precisely what's happening under the ice, right? There's sort of a general like this is the province, we know these are nice and granitic, but we don't maybe know like how um, fractured those beds are or, or not fractured the beds are. Um, so. Um, I wanted to hone in a little bit into these like hot spots into the sediment transfer. And I know Paul is interested in this fjord, Sermilic fjord. This is like one of the biggest producers. Um, it's just south of the capital um, in West Greenland. And I think it's a really good case uh, for like looking at these processes better and looking at the whole source to sink system. Um, what I show you here is the bed map in a color scheme. And um, in the uh, subglacial topography, there's these huge troughs, like sort of, they're basically fjords that extend way under the ice too. And so some of these troughs are associated with the big sediment producers too. You can see that over here, you can see that over here, and you can see that over here. And so just, um, the inherited topography over many glacial cycles probably controls some of these like hot spots in sediment production at the like really modern time scale as well. Um, this is hypothetical. Um, it comes out of our erosion relationship too, because you like that's an ice discharge that you are calculating, and thus you would get high ice discharges if there's really big troughs. Um, but it is not something that we know what's going on under these like big troughs under the ice sheet. Um, so the burning question then was like, how does this, how do these like suspended sediment concentrations like tell us something about like the whole total load? Well, as you guys probably are relatively familiar with, it's like you can just do a fairly simple multiplication by Assuming that you have a turbidity, um, we pulled the meltwater discharges in collaboration with uh, Utrecht University from the RACMO model. This is a, a mass balance ice sheet model. And so that gave us per glacial catchment um, what was the annual total discharge for these systems. So total meltwater discharge. So that's like, it's a regional climate model or regional weather model that drives it, but then there's a mass balance model that's highly or reasonably phys physics based um, that sets this term of discharge. So this is like our um, long-term turbidities and that's like modeled meltwater runoff. So if you then do the math on that and organize Greenland by the different bays in which the reverse um, drain to, you can kind of see like how that's distributed. It's like the southernmost bays are the ones that get most of the sediment um, drained into, into their fjords um, and then into the Arctic Ocean and the like really northern parts of uh, East Greenland, it's very modest. But what I wanted to like pull your attention to is this like total suspended load and put that in the context of like, um, global sediment loads as reconstructed by like Jaya Savitsky and Albert Kepner. And we sort of felt that we were onto like an element that hadn't been mapped. So there's a new sediment flux that hadn't been quantified before that's at, with a large error bar, but at the scale of like about 7%, seven to 9% of the global total sediment loads as reverse drain into the ocean. So quite significant. 
And Greenland, I think, is only like 1% of the land mass. So just to give you an idea of how inflated that contribution of this mini continent is. Um, lessons learned. Um, is, is this something that's of global relevance? Um, yes, it is a significant contributor to global sediment flux. Uh, we learned quite a bit on like non-uniform distribution of these sediment fluxes that it can depend on glacial processes, at least at like a proxy level, um, and possibly on like bad topo topography over multiple glaciations. And so there's quite a bit of process suggestions that are worth chasing further. And um, Ethan Pierce is interested in doing some of that. Another uh, sort of spin-off of this is how much bioavailable iron comes with all this sediment flux. And so one indicator and sort of suggestion that there may be something to that hypothesis that was casted initially by uh, my, uh, my uh, Batia is that summer blooms in Western Greenland, and I'm showing you that here, have actually increased over, have an increased net productivity. And so um, that really big hotspot is like right in this area too. Like, so there's a lot of sediment that goes in there fairly directly without a huge buffer of a fjord. So that's interesting too. The mechanisms and nutrient concentrations still are under much debate, and that's more of a like I would need to collaborate with people who do the oceanography side of that um, to get anywhere. Um, I wanted to switch it a bit to local implications and tell you about delta propagation. So Meta Bendixson um, for her PhD out of Copenhagen. Um, was one of the students who got involved in using a rare air photo archive um, and applied that to um, 100, I think, oh, 121 <laughs> deltas um, to show progradation of deltaic system. So she has like old aerial photos, she has the earliest satellite imagery and then a more dense sediment or satellite record for like the later parts of like the 90s into the 2000s up to now. This archive is really stunning. Um, it was one of the first places where like really aerial photography got used to like systematically map um, coastlines and glacial outlets, etc. Um, this was started in the 1930s. They flew this with an open plane. You can kind of see the pilot like sitting there and then there's like two people who manage the camera that's like in the bottom here and like takes photos down. And so um, the other part of this, um, oh yeah, and it must have been like really cold even if they're flying this in the summer. So like they were wearing like polar bear pants. Um, the other part that was interesting about these archives is they got archived in these bunkers in Denmark and basically disappeared out of like scientist attention for a long time and they were uh, rediscovered by like the Museum of Copenhagen in the 2000s and set off a bunch of these comparison studies um, and Meta was one of the students who worked on that. So what she did is she classified deltaic systems in uh, two uh, types. One were like the ones that were in, constrained in the fjord head, the other ones were the ones that were more open and wave, potentially wave dominated or wave impacted. And then systematically mapped through time in three time slots, like how these deltaic systems prograded or how the coastline uh, prograded on these. Um, Delta area is on the y-axis here and time is on the um, um, x-axis. And then this is like the statistical shape of the wave or wave uh, dominated deltas on the uh, left there and then more restricted deltas on the right there. So like the, the ones that are constrained really at a fjord head in a narrow place. And so what she is showing or what we were showing together is that if you step systematically from the 1940s to the 1980s to the 2000s, late 2000s, um, 
you can see that there's like progradation in these systems, like they systematically gain in delta exposed deltaic area. And it's a little bit more pronounced in the restricted deltas than it's in the open deltas, but both show this um, pattern. Um, to put that in map view, um, there was already progradation from the 1940s to the 1980s. These are like deglaciating systems. They always get sediment um, and are active. And so they were doing this early on, but then there's quite a jump um, in progradation rates when you like look at this later period um, over time. And in a way, I thought this was really interesting because it's sort of an independent validation of these models that do the physics of the mass balance of the glacier systems that meltwater correlates um, with delta progradation rates. Um, is that counterintuitive with these suspended sediment concentration stories that we were, that I was just telling you where the meltwater was not the dominant control? I don't think so. I think they are consistent in the sense that the deltaic progradation is much more bed load driven, which is directly related to like meltwater discharge. Cool. Um, Meta then um, came to this idea of like, wow, um, if there's that much sediment being produced, maybe that's a sustainable source of um, sand for Greenland um, to be an exporter of of sand and so she dug um, quite a bit deeper into this in her postdoc that she did at our, in our group or has been working on this um, and even in a more like much bigger global context now um, and is showing that while Greenland is one of the places where they're not short in sand and where um, at least the government can think about like mining sand as a, a um, construction material which is not true in most um, large delta systems. I'll show you a like, tiny little bit. Um, okay. I was like, I'm not having time when I'm in presenter mode. Um, I show you a tiny little bit on like what's up in our group uh, for like sort of next questions or questions that are still lingering because we haven't resolved them. Um, we're still working on end glacial sediment. This is a project with PhD student Ethan Pierce. Um, Brandy Carlson wrote a uh, NSF postdoc. A fellowship project and got awarded that and she will be working on delta front dynamics and I'll show you a tiny little bit about that. And then the last thing that's been really interesting collaboration and we have a paper in GRL that's about to come out that I'm advertising here is collaborative work with uh, Sasha Lightman and Osa Renamom um, who look at sediment that actually is generated on the ice sheet and like how much is that and does that have an uh, effect on uh, albedo of the ice sheet. It's a small component in the source to sink system, but it's a really interesting uh, complex component. So Ethan and I look at um, how much sediment is transported as ice rafted debris. And so this was a sort of a gap in the budget that we uh, casted uh, or that I showed you about because anything that I was talking about was derived from glacial meltwater and transported with glacial meltwater. And none of the sediment that is being entrained in the glacier and then calves off into the fjords was captured in that budget there. So that's really a component of the budget that's still an open estimate as well. And you can do like some back of the envelope calculations based on like old um, concentrations that had been measured in these like very, um, I, uh, or sediment rich basal layers and um, compare that with like thicknesses of the total packages of ice. And since um, satellite data of ice calving are also really well constrained now, this comes out of Alan Enderlin's team, etc. cetera, um, we can have some idea of like what kind of amount of sediment comes out of these systems. Um, if I do that math, um, the basal ice calving flux is actually even bigger than the river meltwater flux. And so this is really not well constrained at all, but it is like intriguing and I think this is worth um, pursuing more. And that's what Ethan and I are doing right now. And so one strategy of that is that we're sampling 
um, from icebergs at different locations around, around Greenland. We did like a campaign in West Greenland last year. Ben Hasswold, who was a previous collaborator, has been sampling on East Greenland. And so we're starting to get like better, uh, very variable um, little data sets to constrain even like the back of the envelope estimates better for Greenland itself. Um, so this is kind of what that looks like. Um, Tom Marquito, who's here at Colorado, is involved in this too. And so he will be uh, helping with iron concentrations in this too. So that not just can we say something about um, total amounts of sediment and grain sizes, which comes out of these like samples, but we can also run them in like mass spec uh, way and um, get some bioavailable iron. Brandy um, works on the following pro problem. Um, this is that kangaroo swap delta that I started the, the presentation with, uh, where there is quite a bit of monitoring, so there's, it's a good site. And it was a time-lapse camera that was running on the delta front. We initially thought we would get like really good plume imagery and say something about sediment concentrations. That turned out not to be true. Um, but there's this striking collapse of the delta front that happens somewhere now-ish, maybe a little bit later. Bam, there it was. So I'll show you that collapse. Um, so um, here there's this huge scallop that like fails along the delta front. Um, and um, it's a very significant oh, part of the mass. And so, what Brandy is asking is like, how significant are these? And how, um, when do these happen? How often do they happen? Um, is there carbon like sequestration that happens with this? And so she will be working on that in the next one and a half years or two years from spring onwards. That's it for today. I know I'm a little over time. Um, I wanted to thank this. This has been a large team effort and uh, many people came into the field and have been working on like developing these algorithms and the data sets, et cetera. And also quite a bit of like logistic supports that comes out of different groups in Greenland as well as uh, uh, through the National Science Foundation. So most of this work is Science Foundation work. Um, the, uh, I, the Greenland Icebergs work is actually an innovative seed grant from the University of Colorado. So I'm grateful that we get to do that work uh, in, a, in a bit different way too. So thank you. Thank you, Irena, for such a wonderful talk. And uh, for all the audience, if you have uh, any question, if you want to ask directly, you can click the participants that button at the bottom of your Zoom and then raise your hand. Then you can unmute yourself and go directly. So we here we have a couple of questions uh, in the chat, chat room. So Irina, could you also read the chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... The Bing Bing, the first one. So uh, Pinmin, yeah, you're asking about the atmospheric correction model for Landsat 7 to get the reflection. Um, um, I mean, I would have to look up the procedure to see. It's like one of the Mod 09 products. I mean, we did um, tar like um, do some raw data processing too because the uh, turbidity and cloud cover are like difficult when you have a really high turbidity then sometimes that gets picked up as cloud cover so not all the correction models uh, um, and cloud cover models are really good so you can't like pull off the shelf um, like the sort of like half finished products um, but like, I would have to refer you to the paper to show like the real procedure of like which ones we were going through. Um, the next question from Jim, Jim Best. From Jim, yeah, Jim asks whether like, did we use SSC for different river systems? There are like different, different samples in there. So they, they and they fell in the same scatter. Um, so we felt, I mean, maybe confident is a, is a big word, but we felt, okay with the data not falling off a chart 
very for the three different river systems that we looked at and they were um they're all in either nisic or granitic nisic terrain but like definitely in nuke the lithology is a little bit different from like the northern more northern systems we don't have good ssc samples from some of the basaltic lithologies and so there we're extrapolating um in the different ones so, um see, 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 see. And so Jim also asks, uh, are these a minimum estimates since do we hire SSC near the bed? And that's a definite yes. Um, we use the, um, yeah. Basically we need, we definitely need more research. So I have a question before I, you know, ask the question from the Yak. So uh, because the most of the melting water from the glacial is kind of episodic. So is any sense, it's, Based on your observation, is possible over there some hyperpicnal flow in the fluid from that turbid water? Yes. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely uh, hyperpicnal events that happen. Uh, um, like that uh, hot spots um, fjord, um, there, we know there's the hyperpicnal events there. Um, on the Kangalusuak, Fjord, that analysis was, or like we did a little bit more of a careful analysis because we've recognized that we would be totally underestimating um, the total suspended sediment concentration if you like ignore everything that dives deep, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, at the concentrations that Kangalutsuak River has, um, the component of hyperpicnal flows is in the order of like maybe, or like that is at the threshold of like going hyperpicnal um, is maybe order of like nine, eight to nine percent. And so, yeah, that's another way how we're underestimating by just yeah. looking at SSC in the river uh, from the satellite. Um, but Wonderful. it wasn't as big of a component as we uh, expected earlier on. The other thing is we know these are happening because they're uh, um, visible in some of the multi beam or the seismics. You can see like small, like, um, turbidite levee channels going down the delta delta fronts and delta slopes so we're um brandy is interested in these and uh, um collecting observations on these two sure, sure we need a photo proposal yeah so uh, uh okay. do i have time to like look at yap's question real quick yeah, yes, and uri's yes, question yap's yep. questions uh, so uh, one question do you expect any feedback between sediment export and ice melt perhaps through the effect of sediment deposition on fluid circulation? Um, I think in the river systems, maybe not as much, but there is quite a bit of uh, research and um, talk in the glaciological community right now on the tidewater glaciers. So the ones that have like a calving front and the stability of the calving front is really dependent on the local bathymetry. And I think there's a huge sediment story there where like if you have all these upwelling plumes, like right there at the delta front, is there enough sediment to like anchor that calving front in place or not? And so people like uh, Ginny Catania and John Jaeger are interested in this problem. Um, Doug, um, I'm blanking on his last name. Um, Brinkerhoff, and so there is a feedback there um, that is being recognized and is sort of an unknown in the tidewater glacier dynamics uh, and responses. So mm -hmm. that's a good question. Very good. So uh, we have Wu Rishatina from the Yunus uh, Haifa. He had two questions. So Irina can read that question. The difference in discharge seems to be affected by sub ice morphology. Do you have a sub ice model for the morphology? And the second question, bathymetry and the high resolution seismic in the fluid will very definitely, I agree. So we try to put a proposal. If anyone interesting, we definitely need to form a team. I want to bring my chirp over there. Since <laughs> yeah, Paul wants to bring his chirp. <laughs> yeah, well, um, that's the only tool I have. <laughs> so Uri, thank you for that question. Um, the 
sub-ice morphology comes out of uh, the radar that has been flown over uh, Greenland really systematically. And they've been doing this because the thickness of the ice is, of course, like really important for mass balance. So, um, so the sub-ice model for morphology or like the, the bed uh, resolution is um, at least like at a proxy level sufficient and we use the actual like bad morphology to like set the thicknesses of the ice so it is incorporated in those graphs and in these results um the people who process the radar will also tell you that at some of the outlets it becomes hard to do the processing quite right and they use um like a continuity equation between the masses that are moving through to like resolve and invert some of the the topography there so there's short shortcuts or like maybe a long cut that is made there too um so maybe not perfect but it is incorporated and and the dong feng li uh, i guess the dong feng from singapore right so mm -hmm. uh, he asked said do you have any idea how much how the sediment fluxes from greenland involved since the lgm so is there any continued change you mean in the near future um yeah there's there's and there's even like a couple of like really good papers that came out that's that take that to like an even much larger time scale uh that came out of i remember like mats Hus was on this um and they came out of copenhagen too paul like a uk um danish um combination where they looked even at over several deglacial cycles like what were like the big patterns in the seismics and like what were the big volume reconstructions of the seismics uh for this area so there is some control on like how this evolves over like glacial deglacial 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 cycles um that came out of greenland like fairly recently from like seismic data um will they continue to change in the near future with global warming i think just from our results, um, if there's speed ups of these glaciers, we would get see more sediment coming out too, because it's like a, a there's a um, sliding, an increase in sliding. Then, thanks, Gil. Yeah. It's nice to see people here, <laughs> even that's, if I don't really see them. <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank you, Irina. So, if we know any other question, once again, as the I mentioned in the beginning, next week, starting from next week, we will have two webinars per week. So Wednesday, uh, for Wednesday, uh, you have a new host uh, from uh, Uchu University talk about global view of the uh, Delta morphology. And next Friday, uh, Uri from uh, you know, Hefa talk about the Nile River drought sediment. And a very interesting talk. Please do come back. And uh, if no any other question, I think uh, maybe we can we can stop here. So thank you for organizing, Paul. Sure, welcome. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. So we will put everything together. I'm sorry today um, there I don't know is the Zoom comp uh, problem or YouTube problem. Well, you know we cannot build the link from the Zoom to the YouTube. We cannot live stream. But uh, we recorded your presentation. We will upload it to the YouTube, and uh, so we will figure out. So, and so thank you very much. I see you. See you. See you guys next week. Okay. Bye bye.